All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 17th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. I want to talk about um, recognizing real Christianity, the kind of Christianity that the apostles delivered on to us. And it, it is, um, I was thinking about this this morning. I was thinking about uh, some of the uh, different forms of non-Christianity or aberrant Christianity. There are, there is. I got a stack of some examples here, uh, including, including this. And I was thinking after I woke, they all have something in common. Because if you try to fight against all the possible permutations of lies out there, it is a never-ending Thing and have uh, poor Chris Roseboro trying to fight against every false prophet of the charismatic movement. Well, there's a never-ending supply. They keep multiplying like mice or cockroaches. <laughs> and it's like, how are you going to? Uh, if you try to knock them down one at a time, it's a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, <clears throat> sort of a purposeless pursuit, in some ways. Because there's always new permutations of error. Satan has a, you know, he did, but he basically takes the same thing and just, he doesn't care what it is as long as it's different. As long as it's not Christ. So all he has to do is get you off the real. It doesn't matter how he gets you off the real or what he gets you into. It's unimportant. The fact that it's not Christ is what's important. So that's all he has to do is knock you off that knock you off Christ, and he's got you. So, of course, Christ will draw you back if you belong to him. So we're going to take a look at that a little bit and first start with some scripture. i make sure I'm on the right one here. Yep. So just to, to lay the foundation, what is true Christianity? How do you recognize the real thing? Because it's much easier to recognize real Christianity than it is to, to learn all the errors and all the other false systems, which is endless. So let's go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 21. Now this is written to the church in Corinth, which is in Greece. So Paul talks about the Greeks in particular here, but you could just put the word Gentiles in there if you want. But the Greeks were particularly in love with philosophy, with the love of wisdom. The Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not come to know God. Again, he's writing to a Greek audience here. Through wisdom, through Sophia. And what is philosophy? Philosophia, the love of wisdom. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not come to know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The King James reads the foolishness of preaching. That's not really the proper translation. It is the foolishness of the message of the gospel. A crucified Savior. God became flesh and was crucified. That, that sounds like a foolish message, doesn't it? Unless you believe it. <laughs> then, it then it isn't foolish. 
For the Jews request a sign, a miracle, and the Greeks seek for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a crucified Messiah. The word Christ means Messiah. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. The very opposite of what they're seeking. The Greeks aren't seeking for foolishness, and the Jews aren't seeking for a stumbling block. Uh, the idea of a Messiah that's hung on the on a on a tree, on wood, that's that means he's cursed. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why did God put that in the Old Testament? Because he bore the curse for us. But they just see it. Oh, cursed is everybody that hangs the tree. He can't be the Messiah. He's cursed. Yeah. He bore our curse. <clears throat> but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. We preach Christ crucified. We, not just Paul, we, the apostles, preach Christ crucified and Christ risen from the dead. Obviously, just crucified isn't quite enough. But Christ crucified. It's all about Christ crucified. Christ crucified for the sins of the world. Let's go over to another scripture. Second John chapter 1. There is only one chapter, I believe. Sorry, verse 7. For many, now this is written to um, a house church. All churches are house churches at this time. <laughs> um, yes. Probably a wealthier lady, a uh, large house. So when it, do, when it says, do not receive him into your house, it's do not receive him into the church. So this, uh, people will probably apply this uh, in, to like Jehovah's Witnesses, don't let them into your home, which isn't a bad idea either, but don't let them into your home. Uh, yeah, it's, you can deal with them on the front porch. It's probably better if you don't let them into your home. But if you want to, you can, but you have to know what to do with them. Realize they're lost. Do not know God. And so don't argue with them. Proclaim the gospel to them. Don't don't debate on believers. That's foolishness. You're you're putting them on the same level as you are. Don't do that. They you need to proclaim the gospel. You're supposed to proclaim God's message to them, not trying to to reason with them out of your human reason. That's a dead end. Apologetics is stupid uh, because it seeds. You know, we're not told to do that. We're told to proclaim the gospel, not to debate the gospel. It's not up for debate. It's given by God. So if the other side can bring forward a debater that rose from the dead, well, okay. If they can't do that, we don't debate them. <sighs> For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Christ is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. It's literally what it says in the Greek there, too. The. Um, I want to point out, uh, usually this is interpreted as Gnostics, because Gnostics do not regard Jesus as physically coming in the flesh. That's, I don't think that's what John's saying here. He's not referring necessarily to only Gnostics. And this would be a little bit early for Gnosticism comes along um, generally later than when this was written. So we're, we're talking about the first century here, and Gnosticism doesn't appear too much until the second century and beyond. But yes, they denied they were... Uh, Greeks, typically, or Greek culture, and they, their their idea was that the philosophical idea, going back to Plato and others, that the 
the uh, the real the, the higher realm the spiritual realm is good and the material realm is bad so the idea of jesus becoming flesh becoming material is contrary to anything that's good so they denied that so they just said that jesus came in the appearance of flesh not truly in flesh so this does deal with that teaching but it goes beyond that think back to first to john the gospel of john chapter 1 where it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us so it, john i think john is referring to to all the gospel everything christ did the the teaching of christ the apostolic teaching of christ not just the gnostics some try to limit this to the gnostics and in verse 9 i think it, it clarifies that too so uh, sometimes people want to narrow the, the scripture down because they want to escape it <clears throat> they want to eliminate this passage because they don't like it for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not acknowledge jesus christ as coming in the flesh now see this is god becoming flesh john chapter one where he where john himself declares that the holy spirit through john this is a deceiver this is the deceiver and the antichrist it can be translated a there too by the way watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished the preaching of the gospel speaking to a church here but that you may receive a full reward anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of christ or transgresses it's another rendering there uh goes over you know tra uh, to, to trespass or transgress means to go too far too it, it's going across the line do no trespassing when you cross the fence you're trespassing going where you're not supposed to be anyone that goes too far and does not abide remain in the teaching of christ the teaching concerning about christ the apostolic teaching of christ what the apostles delivered about christ not simply christ teaching in the gospels does not have god so if you don't abide in the apostolic teachings, which is the Gospels and the epistles, everything that's about Christ, you've gone too far and you do not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. Uh, 1 John talks about the same thing. If anyone is not the Son, neither has he the Father. It's like the, the Jews, they do not have God. They are not of God because they deny the Son. The, whole, the Muslims do not have God because they deny the Son. doesn't mean they, they uh, don't believe in the one God. They just don't possess him. He does, they don't belong to him. Uh, they're just acknowledging a fact that everybody knows that God exists. But because they deny the Son, their doctrine of God is not true because God sent his Son into the world, and they deny that. They say, Muslims, for example, say Jesus is, a, is a, a prophet, a very important prophet. In fact, he, he will come again. They acknowledge that. They acknowledge that he was born of a virgin. They acknowledge that. They do not acknowledge that he's the son of God. And that may be because they have a crude understanding of that, which would be something that people could explore. Um, it might be an avenue if you could show them that what how are you understanding the the incarnation see they they have a muslims have a aristotelian uh, view the, the uh, classical theism which was polluted the church too uh and the idea of god's absolutely perfect and absolutely changeless and how can an absolutely perfect and changeless god possibly become flesh can't can't classical theism is is serious error and it is a pollutant in the church. So classical Christian theism, too, uh, which is uh, Roman Catholics, uh, especially Calvinists, it's wrong. It's simply wrong. It doesn't describe the God of the Bible. It describes a hypothetical God that existed only in the mind of Aristotle, who had a strange, well, his, his particular idea of perfection. 
That's the basis of all the strange ideas, is Aristotle's idea of perfection. And so <clears throat> Aristotle's God could not possibly become man, uh, could not possibly do anything other than contemplate himself, and doubtful whether he could actually do that. Because, because of his absolute changelessness, his absolute perfection necessitates absolute changelessness and absolute isolation from everything other than himself. It is that God can't create, that God can't know anything outside of himself. And if you listen to some of these uh, uh, high-end Calvinist theologians, um, yeah, If you want to go with Aristotle, you've just abandoned the scriptures. And try to bring those two together. Well, Aquinas did that. Aquinas. You end up with gobbledygook. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So that's the same kind of thing here. So anyone that does not abide, that goes beyond what has been delivered. Again, uh, Jude, contend for the faith once for all delivered. It was fully delivered. So every, like the Roman Catholics, they talk about tradition being equal with the scriptures. No, because the traditions that talk about did not exist in the first century. Of course, just like the Pharisees, they'll say, yes, they always existed in some form. They'll talk about the development of doctrine. No, if it wasn't taught by the apostles, it's not part of the faith delivered once for all. It is going too far, and it is not abiding in the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine that Christ himself delivered and his apostles that he chose delivered. That is the teaching of Christ. Anyone that adds to it, they've gone too far. Anyone that takes away from it, they've gone too far. Watch yourself that you do not uh, lose what we have accomplished. What did they accomplish? What did John accomplish? The preaching of the gospel. Brought salvation to them in Corinth. And Paul before. But that you may receive a full reward. Anyone that goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. One who, does, who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Anyone who comes to you and does not bring this teaching the teaching of Christ, do not receive him into your house, which you could put church there, and do not give him a greeting. For anyone who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. So in other words, if a false teacher comes to your church, these are all house churches, which is probably is the most biblical form of church, and uh, assuming it's done really, uh, it's it's still the best. It's still the best. It has it has issues with it, but compared to what we do today, uh, we cause all kinds of problems for ourselves. But so if if somebody a false teacher comes to your church that doesn't bring the proper gospel of Jesus Christ, that that something addition or denies something like denies the incarnation, uh, denies uh, the deity of Christ, uh, anything like that, don't greet them. Because why don't allow them in? Because you are, especially in a, a, a gathering of the believers, you are giving the impression that whatever this guy's bringing is acceptable. You're welcoming him in as if it's a, a, a teaching of Christ. But if it's something different than the apostles taught, do not embrace it. Do not even, you know, call it out. Push him out the door. Of course, false teachers like Jehovah's Witnesses do not come to the door and say, Hello, we're Arians. We do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. We'd like to talk to you. Bang, you know. No, you, well, you can do what I did last time they came to the door, um, and I they, were, they start their spiel, their, their sales pitch. And so what I did is I interrupted, which was difficult. I said, Wait a minute. Who are you? And they said, they said something. Well, we're just some people. No, who do you represent? 
<laughs> they, they wanted to avoid that. And then once I, they did that, and I said, we are Christians in this house. This was on, you know, I didn't let them in the door. And they said, we are Christians too. And I said, no, you're not. You do not worship the God of the Bible. You do not have a Savior. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. And about that time, the older one said, okay, we, we got to go on. See, you, you confront them with the gospel. You do not debate the gospel. So I can act like I, I know they're Arians. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. He's only a creature. He's the angel Michael somehow turned into a man, which... <laughs> But you don't, even, don't bother with that. Just say, you don't believe in God's Messiah. You don't believe in Christ. You don't believe he was God. You're not a Christian. All Christians believe that. If you don't believe that, you're a heretic. If you don't believe that Jesus is God, you are a heretic. Don't, don't waste your time. If, ideally... In hindsight, what I would, would have done is, well, I know what would have happened. If you have the opportunity, well, you'd probably just tell them this. You know, either of you can come back anytime. If you want to hear about Jesus Christ and why he is God and what he did for you and how Jesus Christ died for your sins, you can contact me privately. I'm usually around. You know, you come at night or something. Nobody will see you. I'll get up, talk to you. <laughs> You can do the Nicodemus thing, but as long as they're, they go two by two to prevent that from happening, they don't want you to get one and one with one of them. They have an older one and a younger one who's being discipled. So, but that's just a Jehovah's Witness. The Mormons do the same thing. So, okay, how many gods are there? Get to the case. How many gods does the Bible say there are? One. How many gods do the Mormons say exist? I mean, exist anywhere. Well, do you have a God who came, became man and died for your sins? One God, the only one God. And he came, became man and died for your sins. And that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Do you believe that? They can't say yes. Do you want to believe that? That's like, you say, no, well, no, we got it works. How would you like to have free salvation? Eternal life is a free gift. So it is, it's useful to know something about them, and then you can cut them off and then give them the gospel, or at least give them the opportunity to hear it. All right, so the point is, I'm, I'm trying to make here is, how do you recognize the, the real? Christ crucified. First of all, we're preaching Christ crucified, Christ risen from the dead. Paul's, uh, that's what they always preach. If you go back in Acts, you always hear Christ crucified and Christ risen. Without a risen Christ, Christ crucified doesn't make any, you know, so what? The Romans killed millions, thousands at least of people, crucified them. Uh, who knows how many thousands they crucified? Killed thousands at a time and crucified them. So how do you, we need to recognize the real, the real gospel, the real Christ. And that's how, you, and if it's not that, they're gone, they've gone too far. They're, they're outside the teaching of Christ, the teaching delivered to us by the apostles and Christ himself. So it's like this book here that I did a video on. Right. This is not about Jesus Christ at all. There, there is no gospel in this book. It is, it is not about Christianity at all either. In any form, other than Roman papal dictatorship. You know, his his Christian prince and his theocracy, which is Roman Catholic, is what Roman Catholic is. It, th this is just a hook, because Americans are going to say, 
you know, or, or many Christians around the world who say, yeah, I'm Christian, case for Christian nationalism. And God, God divided the world up in the Tower of Babel because he didn't want everybody united. So, you're, so the, God is against globalism. So, yeah, of course. I'm in favor of Christian, and I'm in favor of there being separate nation states. Am I a Christian nationalist? Not, that's not what's in this book. I could agree with that. What do you mean by that? Well, somebody is doing a little bit of a switcheroo here, bait and switch. So they give you an, a, a title that many Christians in the United States would agree with. You could easily make that case. Well, God divided the nations up, so God doesn't want a one-world government, right? That's contrary to God's will. Going back to the Tower of Babel. Well, yeah, well, that's, that's, I could argue. And, and we're all supposed to believe in Jesus Christ. We're all supposed to be Christians, right? Because Jesus is the Messiah. He's God's Savior. God sent his Son into the world to save sinners like us, right? Most Americans will say, yeah, of course. <laughs> you may have to remind them of the facts, but, uh, you know, two-thirds will say, yeah. So uh, you should read this book. No, <laughs> no. Not if you don't want the most evil dictator that's ever been present in the Americas. See, to the, you know, there's a strange thing about this. Uh, this guy, Stephen Wolf, doesn't consider the sinfulness of humanity at all. <laughs> yeah, we're going to give this, we're going to install a Christian prince and give him absolute, unlimited, total power to do whatever he wants. Wonderful idea coming out of Christians? No, no. Not even the Dia's founding fathers were that naive. That's nuts. That's just plain nuts. It took Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, let's see, um, like 1,400 years to get there to an absolute papacy. It, it didn't, oh, they didn't, <laughs> Augustine didn't wake up one morning and say, we need a Christian prince that has absolute power, he's absolute autocrat, he is a, a theocracy based on a sinful man. <laughs> no, this is, this is so stupid. Yet there are all kinds of people out there following this. Young men, um, Southern Baptists that have, been educated at Southern Baptist seminaries and everything else, they are going for this, be out of fear. They look at the world and say, yikes, we got to do something different. So it is fear uh, that leads them to, to even consider garbage like this. The same kind of fear led to a certain German being accepted and given absolute power. Even that didn't happen overnight. Uh... <sighs> The other thing, younger people, all you young guys, I want to tell you, this isn't the first time this kind of stuff has happened in the United States. The chaos in the United States. I grew up during the 1960s. And that was coming out of the 50s. So you had the four, in the 40s, you had World War II. In the 50s, came out of that, but the, the fear that was of uh, the possibility, you know, when the Russians set off a nuclear bomb, we thought we had total power. And then the Russians set off a bomb, and it was about 1947 or something like that, and said, oh, I, we didn't think they could do anything like that. <laughs> Those are backwards people, you know. <laughs> really, that's the arrogance, of American arrogance uh, already was really taken hold. Well, it already is. It's always been there. People aren't by nature arrogant and <clears throat> sinful people. And then also out of that became this whole environment of fear in the 50s of uh, the possibility of imminent destruction, nuclear war, uh, culminating in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I can remember that as a, as a child. I remember have nightmares about the Russians coming up the street and, you know, 
your kids, the little kids, see some news, and and of course, even at the schools, you had the duck and cover exercise, like it would do anything. Well, it maybe it was far enough away that it just knocks the ceiling tiles off. But duck and cover was you were taught that in the, when the alarm goes off for a nuclear strike, ever now they didn't have missiles yet. They just had bombers, but you you duck under your little desk, and that's going to protect you. All that did was instill fear in children. That's all it did. Sort of like masking. Didn't really do anything, just instilled a, an attitude of fear, and which is probably what they were intending to do. Um, but the... Uh, also at that time, in the late 50s, you had the, the McCarthy witch trials. Uh, Joe Mc, Senator McCarthy, I think it was Joe McCarthy from Wisconsin, I think he was a Republican, he launched a, uh, a Senate inquiry into communist, uh, communists in the United States. So people that were holding communist ideas or were part Communist Party members uh, and, and treating them as as enemies, so they they uh, canceled a numerous people from Hollywood, in particular, that held held some communist ideas because they they believed in that ideology, in some form, Marxist communist ideology. So they were they were uh, say once they, they were publicly exposed by McCarthy, even if they didn't uh, as a he'd bring them up in the Senate. And expose him. Have you ever been uh, a member of the Communist Party? Have you ever associated with the Communists? Anything like this? Guilt by association, everything, and then publicly outed them in front of the United States, and they became they canceled, canceled. Nobody would touch them with a ten foot pole because nobody else wanted to get pulled up. If you if you, if you uh, defended them, then you were guilty too. The commun the McCarthy witch trials. And finally, it got so bad that they decided no more, no more. Cancel, time to cancel McCarthy. Uh, and then in the 60s, by about 1964, you had the, the growing uh, racial strife and you had the, uh, the, the riots. You had the uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and others, Malcolm X, and more radicals. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was on the, the peaceful side. Uh, the, he was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, pa uh, what do they call that? It's not uh, civil disobedience. It was not passive. Maga uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, what he would do is he would, you, ha you had to have the cameras present. You had to have the cameras, and it had to be with a, with a, a ruling power that was Christian. Otherwise, this doesn't work at all. <laughs> so you'd go out there, and march down the streets and the authorities would try to stop you and you just keep marching anyway and you let them beat you in front of the newsreel cameras. If the cameras aren't there, you don't do it. Because then you then you put these pictures on these films out in the public so people see the authorities beating people that are unarmed and are simply marching down the street. That is not passive resistance. <laughs> that is an active form of resisting things. Um, it's just not you inflicting the violence. It's letting the other side inflict violence on you and for public consumption. But that was going on. So, and then, of course, it went beyond that. You'd end up with riots and cities in flames. It was chaos. I mean, the newsreels, you see all these, these cities in flames, Bur people burning down their neighborhoods, uh, burning everything, just like we saw uh, in the riots having to do with Trump with uh, Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all this stuff, only on a much larger scale. This was the 1960s. And then you had the Vietnam War that the United States got itself into, too. Under LBJ, who was he was had this great he was the one bringing in all the welfare and everything else, great society. At the same time, he got us involved in under you know, not solid circumstances. 
trying to save a corrupt puppet regime in South Vietnam. We, the going back to the French, the United States picked the wrong side. We should have sided with Vietnamese and their independence uh, and got in there and been a supporter of an independent Vietnam rather than trying to back the French and recolonizing their former colonies. Bad choice. We could have prevented all that. We put, probably could have got together with the Soviet Union and made a better, an arrangement too. No, it was just all fear mongering and it was terrible. So, and then you had the riots about that because of the draft and everything else, and the campuses were up in flames, and there was bombings going on, and terrorist groups arising, everything else in the '60s. So I look at I look at what you know, like what was going on a few years ago, and I said, "Huh, nothing new." But it, it creates this fear, this atmosphere of fear, and atmosphere of fear is what provides the opportunity. For, for unmedicated evil like this, people like McCarthy, uh, you go to extremes. You're afraid, so therefore you're willing to accept an absolute despot that is labeled Christian. Bad. Out of fear. Not out of love. Not out of faith. Out of fear. So this book has nothing to do with Jesus Christ and the gospel. Absolutely nothing at all. Nothing to do with the Bible at all in here, except a misquoted use of, I said you are gods. So the, again, the, uh, the Christian prince in here is the vicar of God. The earthly substitute for God. And of course, like the Pope, he has to be worshipped. Well, could this just be a Catholic thing? <sighs> Took them a long time to get to Vatican I and declaring the Pope infallible. This guy gets you to start with it. The infallible Christian prince. <clears throat> More Rushduni. Instead of the Christian prince, the theocrat, you have theonomics, installing the law of Moses over the whole world. Yeah, that, solved, that made Israel such a holy nation, right? Israel that God was judging for idolatry and... God sent into exile twice, uh, not counting the 70 AD. Yeah, that, that, that worked out just fine. The Bible itself says the law of Moses is only temporary, uh, that Christ fulfills the law. The law, Christians aren't under the law. They don't care because it's not about Christ. Rush Juni is not about Jesus Christ and the gospel. This book is not about that. You listen to any of these guys that are in favor of this kind of stuff, you can find them all over the Internet. They've been around for a while. Um, it's not about Christ. It's not about the gospel. It's not about Christ, Christ crucified, Christ risen from the dead. It's not about salvation. It's about ruling. It's about power. It's about imposing the law who kills people. The law only kills. Theonomy, Bonson, not about Jesus Christ. It's not about the gospel. It's not in this book. Another one, Joe Boot, the, the Bible of Apologia Church, the Bible of Jeff Durbin, the Bible of uh, James White. This is our mission statement. Somehow they went from the gospel of Jesus Christ to this. Now, Jeff Durbin, the teenage mutant nin ninja turtle, I can understand. But James White, he was a defender of the gospel for many, many years. Now he's promoting this, which is nothing but theonomy imposing the law of Moses, and that will produce... Be out of fear. What led James White to that conversion? I watched him for years. Looking at the world, looking at what's happening, seeing the decline in Christianity in the United States, decline in Christian values, decline in religion, religious Christianity, out, afraid for his grandchildren, and he said, that's, that he explained, that's when he picked up, and although not terribly um, openly, but he, he gave the, told us that he's, he's gone to post-millennialism because he wanted something more optimistic. 
He's gone to this because he wanted something more politically active to save America for his grandkids. He's, it's not about the gospel. It's about saving the culture so his grandkids don't have to endure what they'll have to endure because we're in the end days. He didn't like that. He rejected that. He apparently was raised as some sort of a fundamentalist or well, that might be a Southern Baptist for him. And uh, he didn't believe that. And his position, he said, was he wasn't any of the pre mill pan mill. He was, he was pan mill. It'll all work out in the end um, kind of thing. Doesn't matter. He avoided that. So then, then he said, no, he wanted something optimistic that he could work at to improve the future for his grandkids. Well, sorry, James, you can't, you don't have the power to do that. And it's not God's plan. Postmillennialism basically came about largely during the 19th century, an age of optimism with technology development and, and uh, humanity was, was uh, multiplying and taking dominion over the earth. Uh, I mean, we built the the Suez Canal and the, the Panama Canal. Well, that wasn't really in the 19th century, but uh, the railroads, technology, all this stuff was coming about, telegraphs. Uh, humanity was conquering the world. And that, so it was optimistic. We can do it. We can do it. Science, real science was developing. Uh, physics, uh, the, the, especially uh, the things that would develop into electronics, the, the understanding of the forces of nature, and then out of understanding, then figuring out ways to use that, all that, everything we have today, all the digital stuff really goes back to, to people like Faraday and uh, Maxwell and others in the 19th century. So not so much Franklin, Rose, uh, Fa Benjamin Franklin. He discovered electricity or something, but uh, it was uh, didn't know anything about it, but it came later. So it's this. It was as, uh, this is the agenda of apologia to change the world. So it's, it's all about fighting against abortion and political activism. It's really wokeism, the same thing, uh, the uh, same as the 1960s with with all the the uh, civil rights and uh, the anti-war, all that stuff, same kind of stuff. Same thing, just relabeled. So you got all kinds of different things, and then you've got this. <laughs> Roman Catholic propaganda. Some poor sucker, a Presbyterian, I believe, who, uh, could be wrong on that, who went to Rome. So out of the Calvinist frying pan into the Catholic fire. Why do people do this? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, they're not born again. That's the, the re real reason. They're not born again. They don't have a real relationship with God. Otherwise, they wouldn't do this. They wouldn't go this direction. It's like, like I was looking, I've looked at this. I mean, I've looked at Rome. I've attended a lot of Roman Catholic services. I married into a Roman Catholic family, or actually <laughs> saved their daughter from a Roman Catholic. Uh, and their children were not, the parents, my grandparents are my uh, in-laws, my father and mother-in-law, were uh, pretty devout Roman Catholics. Their kids, not so much. It's like, how can we get away from going to Mass? My wife told me that uh, she and her sister, her sister was older, so she had a driving license, and th they would say, well, we'll go on our cell by ourselves because we want to go someplace else later. <laughs> they somehow never got there, or, or they got there and picked up a bulletin or something like that to, to, as evidence that they went uh yeah so this error the, what's 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 the problem with this well they preach jesus christ right well sort of it's not the focus is christ the focus 
Is the teachings, is Christ front and center? Or is there something mediating Christ? Yeah, the institution. The institution is the means of grace in Roman Catholicism. When somebody talks about means of grace, you're usually talking about institutional Christianity. They're talking about the sacraments, including uh, John Calvin. So you have the preaching of uh, Protestants, the preaching of the word, uh, that's a, like a sacrament, <laughs> a means of grace, attending the institutional church, a means of grace. And then you've got baptism as a means of grace and a communion as a means of grace and perhaps confession as a means of grace and, and uh, doing good things for the, the preacher as a means of grace. Tithing is a means of a grace. The law is a means of grace. Of course, this is all about law. You've got to keep the Ten Commandments, <laughs> which is a pretty reduced list, and the seven laws of the church. Plus, you have to go to confession at least once a year, uh, to miss mass, to go to mass every week. To miss that, some regard as a mortal sin. And then you have to go to confession every time you miss Mass. So it's all about what you do. It's not about good news. It's not about what Christ did. Although he's, he's not absent. He's just, there's this institution that has put itself between you and the Savior, and it takes his grace and meters it out to Catholics according to its rules and desires. Except I think Francis is pretty much choked off the supply of grace altogether. Which is why they're upset about him uh, uh, destroying the, the mass of what he's doing, redefining it as paganism. His goal is to gut Catholicism. Then you've got this. This came up. Woke Church... Um, was this Southern Baptist or where did he go? It doesn't say on the back here. BS in psychology, Bowie State University, Master of Theology. Oh, Dallas, that's right. I was thinking, didn't he go to Dallas? The, the premier dispensationalist school, Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, a, a master's from there and a doctorate from Gordon-Conwell. The, these are not fringe institutions. <laughs> this, this has nothing to do with Christianity. This is about black identity and guilt-shaming non-blacks. I don't know. Where do Hispanics fit into that? It's a good question. Where do Hispanics fit into that? Of course, when you go to someplace like the border in Texas, I was the minority, a very small minority there. And I go across the border the same way. Not there, there are Mexico, there, there are some uh, uh, a German population in. Uh, and, and of course, well, in Mexico, you've got a severe system of racism. You have the, the European, original European immigrants from Spain, uh, the white blue-eyed, blonde-haired, perhaps, uh, very, very uh, European features. And then you have a German uh, immigrant population, Mennonites, too, uh, immigrated. Uh, in some, they have some settlement areas in Mexico. But the, the white um, European Mexicans are the upper class. They are, at most uh, Mexicans are mestizo. They're a mix between European and uh, Native American. And then you have the, the, the Native Americans themselves. And, and there's a, uh, you, can, you see the feature difference. You can, you can look at somebody and see how much, they, but there, some people have more, you can vis, visually see that there's much more Native American and others are much more European. But the European is the, the high. So they've got their own racial thing going on there. Um, the Europeans are looked down on the others as less pure. 
Most are, mis are, most are mix, mestizo. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all. But it's just, you know, human nature being what it is. So what do you do with something like that <laughs> that's in Mexico? So I suppose I would have to, to do, would, would white identity work? Well, we know what white identity is. This isn't the first racial identity movement. Ku Klux Klan in the United States. Ku Klux Klan. Big deal in the 19, uh, 1920s. Big deal. <coughs> Big organization. <coughs> One of my father, grandfathers was in it for a short while until he found out what it was. What did they do? How did they become big? By this. Christian nationalism. Flags. The American flag parading down uh, through the Capitol with tens or hundreds of thousands of people, Klan members. It was Christianity apple pie and the American flag. Just like Donald Trump. I'm not equating Donald Trump with the Ku Klux Klan, but the Ku Klux Klan used these things. It used Christian and nationalism, pride, uh, patriotism, mix those two together as a way to sell their racist organization. They were very successful at it until the federal government decided to uh, take it down by going after the leadership, which was obviously was corrupt. Uh, any group like that, the leadership is always going to be corrupt. They're sinful, and they're in a position of, of being able to express that through their power. It's like the, the leadership of the Black Lives Matter. They went corrupt. You just put all this money all this free money in front of somebody, and unless they are really a Christian, what's going to happen? Especially with somebody that doesn't have all that money to start with. It, it just corrupts them. It's like winning the jackpot, you know? What happens? But that, that's how the Ku Klux Klan became big. Piggybacking on things that most Americans would identify with. And they didn't just lynch blacks, by the way. That, but they see, it was not the, uh, the, the lynching, cross-burning stuff so much at that time. They, they, uh, they got very savvy with promoting certain other values and putting on spectacles. They were Huh, Hitler might have gotten some of his ideas from the Klan, but they were uh, he got ideas from the concentrate about the concentration camps and the ghettos from American and how the United States treated the Native American population. Uh, it's a matter of history. So we have these. Of course, Satan, Satan is one, the one that does these things that use these these movements that he baits you. And it's 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 bait and switch. So he gets you in, and then uh, then he then you find out the reality. So these are none of this. Of course, Ku Klux Klan is not Christian, even though it claims to be Christian. Why? Because it's not about Christ crucified, even though they burn crosses. <laughs> it's not about Christ crucified for the sins of the world. There, there's no racial element in Christ's crucifixion, is there? for the sins of the whole world, unless you're a Calvinist, because they're about the only ones that deny that. Not for the sins of the everyone. They would say the sins of the whole world, but uh, not individually. Another false gospel, Rick Warren. So what's what's common about all these things? It's not about Christ and him crucified. It's not about the, the gospel as it was delivered through the apostles. It's something else. It's going beyond that taking you off of Christ, not Christ in the center, using Christ for something else. They do that. But it's not what the focus is. 
What's the focus? Is Christ front and center? Is Christ crucified front and center? Is salvation by grace alone through faith and alone in Christ front and center? Or is it about something else like this? Rick Warren, Purpose Driven Life. How many, uh, oh, you got blurbs on the back from Billy Graham and Franklin Graham, Bruce Wilkerson, the prayer of Jabez fame. I wouldn't want that in the back of any book I wrote. See, the Rick Warren isn't about the gospel. Lee Strobel, author of the... I don't know if these people actually read this book. A lot of times you just find somebody that's willing to do it um, for whatever. It's, it's you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back kind of thing, I think. Or they pay for it. Who knows? This, um, Max Licato. Another guy that's a problem. So is, is what's this book about? The meaning of your life. Finding your meaning. Finding your identity. But it's not about Christ crucified. It's using Christ to find your identity. Purpose-driven. It's finding your purpose. Christ is sort of connected to that. But it's about... It's about finding your purpose in the world. It is not about Christ crucified. The only gospel presentation in this book is a, about one paragraph. doesn't talk about sinfulness, really. doesn't talk about the, the human condition uh, much. But what it says is, say this prayer. Repeat after me. And if you're sincere, welcome to the kingdom of God. That's salvation, according to Rick Warren. And that's why, you know, his churches are about giving people what they want. Before he wrote this book, which has sold like 40 million or more copies. Well, let me read some of the blurbs in the back. We can kill two birds with one stone by doing that. A groundbreaking manifesto on the meaning of life. Well, you could say that Jesus Christ is that. Make, this is from Billy and Franklin Graham. Make sure you're not missing the point of your life. Read this book. Not the Bible. Read this book. The purpose-driven life will guide you to greatness. Through living the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. Gra guide you to greatness. Is the purpose of a Christian his own greatness? No. Did Jesus teach his disciples to pursue their greatness? No. He said that these those who are least among you, um, you know, he's... what. It, then he washed his disciples' feet. It is the world who pursues greatness. Christians pursue other things. They pursue Christ. He is the, the one we look to. We're not trying to be great. If you're trying to be great in yourself, that's nothing. You're, that, that's sinful human nature. That's what sinners do. That's not what Christians do. Well, Billy, Billy Graham and Franklin Graham do not represent true Christianity, really. It's decisionism, which is this, too. That's why they would do this, because Rick Warren promotes the same gospel that they promote, really. Okay, Bruce Wilkerson, <laughs> the prayer of Jabez. Really? That was a big thing. All kinds of books. Say this prayer. Yeah, that was bad prayer. Say, bless me, God. Bless me the way I want to be blessed, not the way God wants to do it. God wants to. <laughs> he intends to do a complete renovation. Destined to be a classic on the Christian life, I predict the, the purpose-driven life will become my utmost for the highest, for his highest of the 21st century. That's another book that's not worth reading. 
timeless, profound, compelling, and transforming. That sounds more like the New Testament than this book. No, no, this this book is no longer on the number one seller list. Oh, was, when was this done? But I know I remember this when I was a pastor for a while in an SBC church in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, copyright two thousand two. Yep, that would be. This was a new thing then, and it was, uh, it was a firestorm. I mean, everybody was doing. The churches were doing this stuff. They wanted me to do it, and I said no. <laughs> no, no way. And I hadn't even read it. Uh, this is not the gospel. This is about you. Rick Warren says it's, it's not about you. Yeah, but it really is. This whole book is about you. You finding your purpose. You becoming great. Donald Trump would love this book. It's, it's not about God and finding God's purpose. So transforming, yeah, priceless gift for anyone who wants to know the purpose and know their purpose and fulfill their destiny. It's not about fulfilling your purpose and fulfilling your destiny. The purpose-driven church, as the purpose-driven church, has had a profound impact on the church world, worldwide. Uh, has had the, the most profound impact on the church worldwide of any book in this generation. This is poison. This is poison, absolute poison. Don't believe the title, Growth Without Compromise. No, the whole message is absolutely compromised. This ground, uh, Rick Warren's new groundbreaking manifesto will set millions of people free to live their lives, the lives God intended. This book is, this is the book we've all been waiting for. Well, by the author, of the man who wrote Prayer of Jabez, made a bundle on that. Bunch of crap. It was nothing but God will give you what you want if you're bold enough to pray for it. So Strobel, oh, jeepers, this is so bad. Max Lucado, same kind of stuff. Number one New York Times bestseller. What on earth am I here for? Finding your purpose. No. No, everybody looks for that. 1960s. Uh, but that led, you know, um, when, I, when Christ called me to himself, and he was calling young people, and they were not all involved with the hippie movement or anything else. There was this, this dispersed, unlike previous so-called revivals, where you had certain preachers going out with a message, and they would get people saved, supposedly, at these different locations as they went about preaching. What happened in the Jesus Revolution was, was different completely. It was... God. We had a generation that was um, disillusioned by the world and the things of the world because we basically had prosperity. After World War II, everything rebuilt and everything. Everybody had, you know, have a new car. And a, the, the goal was to have your own new house and a new car and have everything you didn't have as a child during the Depression. So they, they achieved that. We had other than the absolute fear of being incinerated by a nuclear war, uh, <laughs> looming in the background. Uh, yeah, it was uh, I had prosperity mostly. Um, uh, people weren't starving, nothing like At least the, most people in the United States. And then, then uh, you had like the Great Society program, the, the growth of the welfare state, so the, the semi-socialism in the United States came in under LBJ, uh, but you also had the Vietnam War, and people were asking questions. Young people were asking questions. You know, to that age, when you you've graduated from high school or coming into your senior year in high school or something, what do I do with my life? What's the purpose of life? Why am I here? You start asking those questions. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? 
and the uncertainty of everything, people were looking and searching. You had the hippie movement and all this strange stuff, too, uh, Eastern religions uh, in the hippie movement, uh, Hinduism, the, the, the transcendental meditation, because they'd grown up in churches that were not alive. They didn't see God there. They didn't experience God's power, transforming power. Uh, let me say something right now. The greatest miracle, Jesus said to his uh, apostles and disciples, greater works than I shall you do. And indeed, the Charismatics and Pentecostals say, well, that's just all the miracles we do. No, it's not. The greater work that Jesus Christ was talking about was the work that God would begin to do at Pentecost. The, the miracle of the new birth, the miracle of God's transforming sinners into saints. That is the miracle Jesus was referring to, the greater work, because that he had to die and rise and ascend in order to bring the new covenant about that had been promised in the, in the prophets, where God makes us his children and does a complete overhaul of our insides. We become a new creature in Christ, even though we're temporarily housed in this dilapidated body that is of flesh and has sin in it. But that's only temporary. The, the birth of the sons of God starts at Pentecost. The new covenant coming into force, that is the miracle. And you see that in Acts, of course, the Pentecostals and stuff look for the, the showy nonsense. It doesn't, not important. The, uh, the signs, that's not what is important except for establishing an apostolic authority, and they had certain purposes. But the real power is the transformed life, taking a sinner, especially a wretched sinner, and making him into a saint. That's the miracle. That's the power of God unto salvation which comes from Christ crucified, Christ risen, faith in him. That's the miracle, the promised miracle of God to whosoever shall believe. This book is not about that. It's about finding your purpose in this life, in this world, not finding your purpose in Christ. This book is how to build a sinner-sensitive church, how to build a building and fill it full of unbelievers by giving them what they want. Yeah, uh, church uh, growth without compromising your message and mission. Yeah, the church, in this case, Rick Warren's message and mission, not Jesus Christ. And this book is all about that. I can remember these ideas infiltrating into even the... Uh, uh, ELCA, uh, Lutheran Church, the idea of, you know, doing things that the church's location, their neighborhood, the people around them, it's supposed to be like a yuppie community, upward professional, upwardly mobile, provide good funding for the future, all these things, uh, visibility, you know, uh, parking, all those things. The Gospel According to Man, Building the Man-Centered. Building, to use Augustine's expression, building the city of man, the church of man. What's wrong? It's not the gospel. It's not Jesus-centered. It's not the gospel. It's not Christ crucified-centered. Nothing to do with Christ crucified. That, this would work for the Muslims. This would work for Buddhists. This will work for Hindus. This will work for Jehovah's Witnesses. The purpose-driven Jehovah's Witness. There you go. What do these all have in common? They're not centered on Christ and Christ crucified. They're not centered on the gospel. They're not centered on salvation. Here we go. Charles Stanley, in eternal security. Of course, Southern Baptist, father of Andy Stanley. Um, big television ministry, very big uh, Atlanta, Georgia, very big church, uh, very important in the Southern Baptists. Um, I don't know if he was ever president, but 
So the, the, the Baptist, the common evangelical Baptistic doctrine of eternal security, that means once you've made a decision for Christ, you are saved and go into heaven regardless of what you do. That's eternal security. It is loosely derived from the Calvinist doctrine of perseverance of the saints. It's not the same thing. Perseverance of the saints says those who are elect will persevere in the faith until the end. This says it doesn't matter whether you persevere in the faith or not. Once you've made a decision, God moves you from the lost file cabinet to the found file cabinet to the saved file cabinet. And once you're in the saved file cabinet, uh, it is, there's no removing the file. It can't be removed from the file. You can't, God can't blot out your name from the book of life, or Christ can't do that. Even though the, the, the scripture Jesus warns, you know, he talks about the name being blotted out. He said, I, if you abide in me, I won't blot your name out. So they ignored all those scriptures. So this is an argument to try to prove that once, once you've, you've done the right thing, you've, you did a confession or went forward, made a decision, maybe got baptized, did something, something you did, you're in and you are secure. Your ticket's been punched and you're on the way to heaven, regardless of whether you get off the train or not. That's an older picture of him. This is the man who answered a question about uh, from a woman that son uh, had gone into a homosexual lifestyle who had no intention of repenting. And he was asked, will he go to heaven? Because he made a decision once upon a time for Christ. And he says, yes. He won't, will not inherit the rewards, but he will be there. Does that correspond with what the scripture teaches? No, it does not. A person that does that and persists in that lifestyle, now a person can repent. Christ can call you out of it. If you're really a Christian, he will call you out. Uh, you can abide in a state like that for quite a while. But it, what happens is, do you ever come back? If you stay unrepentant, if you die in that and die in unbelief, die in rebellion, you're lost. Um, which I would say, well, you're probably never really found because you had a a, a false conversion, a real, a, a heart changing conversion. It'd really be hard to get lost <laughs> because <laughs> the Holy Spirit's abiding in you, and uh, you're going to have to be a real rebel to you if you do, if you are insistent. So and just say, I'm going to divorce God. I'm, I, I refuse to be a Christian. I'm going to divorce myself from Christ. Well, if you deny him that way, and it's persistent, uh, Jesus has said, and I'll deny you too then. He'll grant you your divorce. This is not true. It's a lie. It's not about what Christ did on the cross. It's not about what the Christ and his apostles taught. This is in contradiction to the clear teaching of Scripture. There's too many passages that warn us to abide in him, be faithful unto death. You want to throw those out and believe Charles Stanley? Well, you're trusting in Charles Stanley rather than Jesus Christ. That's a bad plan. But this, again, this isn't about what Jesus says. This is not abiding in the teaching of Jesus, not abiding in the teachers of the apostles, abiding in what people want to hear. A false promise that you can live however you want because you made a decision. You can uh, make a decision for Christ and live like the devil unrepentantly your entire life, and you'll go to heaven anyway. That's a false gospel. What kind of life would that be? You're saved from what? The angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Not save them in their sins, save them from them. From the bondage of sin, from slavery to sin. From eternal punishment, because you're, you remain a sinner. <clears throat> what do all these books have in common? Jesus Christ, his teaching, the apostles' teaching of Christ is not front and center. They're presenting something else. 
that pleases people, that people want to hear, not the gospel. Now we're getting a little more subtle. Let me start with this one. Makes it a little easier to understand. John MacArthur preaches the scripture, but does he really preach Christ that much? Is Christ front and center? Is the gospel front and center? So some, sometimes Satan is subtle. He gets servants, or you can have Christians that are pushed a little bit off center. Uh, he, he can use, so it's like MacArthur, if you read his biography, you will search in vain for a salvation account where he was convicted of his sins and uh, saved through faith in the gospel. No, he's, he's like one of these Christians that grow up as a Christian. He was the son of a preacher. And his father chose his profession for him and chose the school he was supposed to go to. And uh, MacArthur himself was more interested in playing football. Uh, but there's no, there's no account. Now, a person doesn't have to have a dramatic account, but a preacher should be able to point to some point where they came to a saving faith in Christ. I couldn't find it in his biography. And he has these strange stories in his biography about how he was a he was present uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated. He was with the black leadership in the civil rights movement the next day examining the, the, the spot where the shot was fired from. He was in. There's this strange account about how MacArthur was with the, was in with the black civil rights movement leadership through one guy, apparently. It, I mean, it's possible. It's true, but I, I har hardly think the, the, uh, the leadership especially after the assassination of Martin Luther King, would be hanging around with a, with a college, young college man with a crew cut. He'd, they'd look at him and say, FBI. Like, uh, they're hardly the kind of people they're going to spend a lot of, they'd be trusting of. And when uh, people have tried to check out that story, well... <sighs> Nobody in the civil rights movement that's still alive remembers that at all. They say, no, he was not there. So we have these strange anomalies in, in MacArthur and some other stories that have come out, too, more recent, um, uh, several. So there, there's questions there. But here, so here's an example of a book that's supposedly written by MacArthur. Some of these books, I think, are based on his sermons, but he doesn't write them. Uh, they're written by staff, or part of the uh, his the schools are given a stipend to write this. So it's got a foreword by R.C. Sproul, uh, Joni Erickson Tata, and uh, the president, Al Mohler, <laughs> president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, Southern Southern Baptist, Southern Seminary. Uh, and the title of this book is uh, Slave, Hidden Truth About Your Identity in Christ. So is the message of the gospel, the message of uh, the epistles, that we're slaves? We're slaves of Christ? The apostle Paul uses that illustration in one place, referring to us because uh, sl deliverance from slaves of sin to slaves of Christ, because slavery was such a common institution at that time. He uses it as a as a uh, analogy. But many other places he talks about, we're, we, for freedom, we are set free. Do not become the slaves of men. So that the, to, to characterize, to make slavery a central thing of the gospel is absurd. Just like to make theonomy a central theme of the gospel is absurd. Or eternal uh, security 
um, yeah, as long as you stay in Christ, you're eternally secure. But this slave, really? He got on the slave kick for a while, and he uh, he distorts the scriptures. This is so. Anytime you you make a, put an emphasis on something that the scripture doesn't put the emphasis on, it's like putting the emphasis on the, emphasis on the wrong syllable. It's not right. Syllable. What's that? What's a syllable? It's a syllable with the accent in the wrong place. So when you when a teacher puts the accent on the wrong thing. They're speaking gibberish, speaking in tongues. Slave, you want to follow somebody to make you a slave? John MacArthur should join the Southern, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. They're really big into slavery. Everybody in the Jehovah's Witnesses, except the remnants of the 144,000, if any of those are still alive, are slaves, watchtower slaves. Well, that sort of fits with the atmosphere the accrediting agency found at his schools. Oppressive, toxic. Slave. Jesus said, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Not about freedom. You could write a book on Christian freedom. No longer slaves of sin. Nah, slaves of Christ. Well, a good son functions like a slave to his father, in a way. But he's a son, not a slave. There's a huge difference. He does the same work, perhaps, as a slave. You know, like you have a, an overseer that's a slave. The head of the house is a slave. But the son is the head of the house. He may do the same things, but he serves for an, an entirely different reason because he's his father's son and loves his father what are we sons or slaves well in john macarthur's church you're a slave how does he get away with that people are christians are sheep sheep are one step above a turkey in intelligence a domestic turkey, not a wild turkey, a domestic turkey, one of the dumbest animals. Uh, you have to be careful. They'll all crowd, crowd together, and they'll kill each other. They'll just... <laughs> uh, sheep, they'll go astray. They're like, they got their nose down and eating grass, and they'll go... You got to have shepherds or sheepdogs or something to keep the sheep from wandering off and getting themselves killed. Falling in a ditch or getting eaten by a wolf or eaten. Out here it's coyotes. Hard to believe. Is the gospel really hard to believe? Not when the Holy Spirit gives you faith. No, it's if, if you're trying to believe in your own power, yeah, I was there. I was trying to believe, trying to summon up faith out of myself. No, is he cast your all you gotta do is cast yourself in the hands of God. Call upon him to save you. Doesn't take much faith to call upon him to save you. You don't have to have uh that uh, saving faith to, to call upon him. He gives you that faith as part of the new covenant. So let's look at that. Oh, before we go to that, let's go one last example of heretic or a heretical emphasis. John Piper, Desiring God. This was another hit book, right? Uh, Piper, the, the seven-point Calvinist. Piper, the one that pastors would every year go to his conferences up in uh, Minnesota. Uh, Piper, who was about, um, well, he's a bit of a... His videos are still on the Internet. You can watch him gyrate all over the place when he preaches. Uh, he's a very passionate man. Let me point out something. Um, Rick Warren, his son committed suicide. So all this, all his gospel, all his stuff, he was unable to save his son. Of course, they, they blamed it on mental illness, you know, but what is that? 
if you know Christ, if Christ is in you, he's going to keep you. Yeah, you can might have depression. The Holy Spirit is not going to let you take your own life. He's going to lead you back to Christ. Because you're his. You belong to Christ. He's not going to allow, he's not the devil to destroy you. But with the gospel that Rick Warren preached, I am not surprised at all. It's an empty, powerless gospel. See, the real gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It transforms your life. It changes your heart. It changes your spirit. It changes your relationship to God drastically. You are now a child of God, a son or daughter of God. John Piper, the interesting thing, I never really got too much past the introduction to this book because it's crazy. Uh, he quotes from... He actually changes the Westminster Catechism. And the, uh, I think one of the first lines in that catechism says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Well, glorifying God, the sovereignty of God, that is a, uh, the core center of Calvinism. It's God's sovereignty and God glorifying himself. You, you, God already is about as glorious as he can get. When God, to, for God to glorify himself means he, he gives us a, a view of him. So we understand God more clearly. That is to glorify him. He reveals himself as he is to us by degrees. <laughs> so he changes the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever to, this is, this is the key central doctrine of John Piper, the chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. It's about your happiness. It's not about God. It is not about Christ crucified. It is not about the gospel. It's about using God to be happy. Your personal happiness. That's what this book is all about. It is entirely self-centered. Which means it's unregenerate. And he goes through what led him to that. And it's entirely of the flesh. And it's, it's not based on Scripture. It's based on non-Orthodox Christian writers like C.S. Lewis and Blaise Pascal. And how unhappy he was because his Christianity, he couldn't make himself Christian. He couldn't... Uh, uh, in his introduction, he explains it very well, and that's all you need to know. He, he was, he was uh, trying to be perfect, sort of. He couldn't do it. It made him unhappy. He would, he would do good, and then he would examine himself and realize, I'm not doing this for the right motives, really, and it makes me feel guilty, <laughs> and that makes me unhappy. So he read some things from C.S. Lewis and Blaise Pascal and realized that, that all men seek to be happy. So there's nothing wrong with being happy. He had this idea that if you were happy, you were, you were sinning. And it transformed his ideas. But, but all men seek to be happy, but all men are sinful humanity. Not saints, all men are sinful humanity. So what, sinful, what all sinners seek to be happy is, does not determine what your theology should be. But it does with Piper. And he went, he, so he, has, he created this entire doctrine about uh, the purpose. Our, we are to glorify God uh, by being happy, by enjoying him. So, the, the, but the goal is happiness, our personal happiness. It's not God. It's the, the goal is actually our personal happiness. So that's what a sinner can do. A sinner will do things 
religious things for their personal happiness because they're self-centered. They don't have a center in God. They don't have a, a, a link with God where God's happiness is our happiness. So God's joy is our God, our joy. See, joy is supernatural. The gifts of the, the Spirit are, the fruit of the Spirit is Christ in us. It's God in us. It is what he produces. It's not our work. Piper never understood that, apparently. And so he writes this entire book, and it goes crazy. Why? Because this, is, this appeals to sinners, Christian sinners that uh, are seeking them. They're self-centered, unregenerate. They're self-centered. So, or at least, or at least immature, they're very fleshly yet. So this appeals to them. Yes. Oh, a doctrine says God wants me to be happy. It's really Joel Osteen, Calvinized, <laughs> or galvanized, Calvinized Joel Osteen. I just that just occurred to me. So if you take a a person that is a, a sort of a theologian or studying that stuff, and and you uh, um, <laughs> Joel Osteen goes to seminary. Yes, that would be it. He never did. Joel Osteen was never educated in seminary or anything like that. So he was uh, grew up as sort of like production manager or assistant for his father. Uh, so no theological training. Not that that's a bad thing, <laughs> but uh, you have to know what the gospel is. See, if you actually are born again, you know what it is. So it's like this. What, what This isn't about Christ and him crucified. No, it's not about sin. It's not about salvation from sin. It's about salvation from being unhappy because he had this literally lust, strong desire to be personally happy. And that drove his theology. So when he found some things that justified his pursuit of happiness so he didn't feel guilty about pursuing happiness, he wrote this. <laughs> so when you get into like MacArthur and, and like Piper, you're getting into subtle errors. But you still, there, still, if you think, is this about Jesus Christ, Christ crucified? Is it about Christ saving us from our sins through faith in him? No. In fact, Piper got so far off that uh, right before the, in, in was it uh, 2017, before the anniversary of Martin Luther's uh, 95 Theses, the birth of the Reformation, sort of, uh, there was a big celebration. He spoiled the fun. About a month or two before, he comes out and with a statement, a public statement, very public statement, that we're not saved by faith alone, that we're saved by faith plus works, which is Roman Catholic doctrine. His doctrine is Roman Catholic. He's never repented of that. He's never backed off on that. Of course, he was pretty much in the process of retiring then, so he didn't have too much to lose. I believe they've had some problems with their kids, too. False gospel. It's not the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. Doesn't, this is not about the new birth, nor is this about the new birth, nor is this about the new birth, nor is this about the new birth, or this is, that's church, this is this. It's not about being born again. No, nothing about that in this book. These people do not say, you must be born again. They don't know what it is, because apparently they've never experienced it. Of course, this is not, nor is this, nor is this, nor is this, nor is this. But you do find it in here. It's not about the true gospel. That's how you identify it. Is it about Christ dying on a cross for the sins of the world, rising from the dead, bringing into effect the promises of God that are in the new covenant, which includes being born again? Born again is what the new covenant's about. 
That's what he was talking to Nicodemus about. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus would have understood Jesus referring to the promises of a new covenant in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 in particular. It's not something we can do. It's like Jesus said, well, how, Nicodemus, how, how, how do you do this? Jesus says the Holy Spirit blows where he wills. You see the effect of it. You don't see the Spirit moving, but you see the effect. So it's uh, the effects of that are the effects of the new covenant. And that didn't come into place, into authority, into power, until prior to Jesus dying, rising, and going to heaven, justifying us, offering his blood in the heavenly temple, in Hebrews, and pouring out the Spirit, the promise of the Father, the promise of the new covenant, the promises that made in Ezekiel 36. I will give you my Spirit. And a whole list of promises there. That is what the new birth is. That God forgives our sins. All of them. And because of what Christ did, we're not under the law anymore. We're not subject to the penalties of the law. Past, present, or future. He takes out the heart of stone, gives us a, a living heart, a heart of flesh, upon which he writes his will, his commandments. He gives us a new spirit. The Scripture says we are made one spirit with him. And he, he's, he says we shall all know him. And Jesus says to know God is to have eternal life. And we become the sons of God, the children of God. And we know him. That is the new covenant. That is what it means to be born again. You probably won't realize all that when it happens, but you will. one thing you will know, you will have faith, real faith. You will know that Jesus Christ died for your sins, and because of that, you are right with God. You have been justified by God because of faith. What is the faith we have to have to come to that point? I'm talking about the faith we have prior to we're born again. When we're born again, he gives us his spirit. He gives, the fruit of one of the fruits of the spirit is faith and faithfulness. And it is it is a when it happens, you know or should know, and I don't want to put my experience on everybody out there. God does things the way he wants, but these things will come to pass, especially as we learn to walk in faith in the promises of God. If you don't walk by faith in them, well, a lot of times, if you don't know what to pray for, you will not get it. You have not because you ask not. So let's go over to Romans 10, which is a passage. Look for a passage. We are interested in a, a thing that, that teaches about that very subject, not just mentions it in passing, but teaches on this. And Romans is so important for people to understand, the first 11 chapters in particular. Um, if you understand that, you're not going to be taken in by dispensationalism. You're not going to be taken in by any of this garbage over here, this stack of garbage books. They're not even good for the compost pile. Too much stuff in them. Too much added material. It's not even natural. <clears throat> so let's go over to, uh, to Romans chapter 10. For this is where the Scripture... The apostle is talking about how we're saved, what you must do to be saved. For Christ is the end, the finish of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. In other words, in Christ, there is no righteousness. The law, as far as uh, for, for believers, we're not under the law. We're not, the law has nothing to do with us being right before God. Christ is. He has satisfied the law for us, paid the penalty of sin, and lived a holy and perfect life, So we, which is called his act of obedience and his passive obedience, referring to his, his death on the cross on our behalf. For in Christ, for Christ is the end of the law, 
for righteousness to everyone who believes. You have to believe. Ah, so Christ accomplished atonement, but the atonement is only righteous for righteousness for those who believe. So you have Christ's work, the cross, and faith in that, in him. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law, the man who does those things shall live by them. Law, the righteousness, in other words, if you keep the law perfectly, you will be righteous with God. Who did that? Only Christ. Only Christ. But the righteousness of faith, the righteousness that's given to us as a gift by God, speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. In other words, uh, it doesn't speak out of human arrogance and human ability and what man does. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You'll hear that expression, word of faith, used by the uh, the uh, Christian sorcerers, the word of faith movement. That's sorcery. Now, that is a, that's not what it means here. It is the word of faith which we preach. What? What is the word of faith? He Next verse, that if you confess with your mouth uh, the Lord Jesus, or Jesus as Lord, can be translated either way, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So who is the Lord Jesus? He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. And believe in your heart. It's, it's not, uh, MacArthur turns it in Lordship Salvation. Uh, MacArthur says you must submit yourself to Jesus as Lord in order to be saved. That's not true. A sinner can't do that because you're still in sin. You're still in bondage. Uh, a person in bondage to sin can't truly say Jesus is Lord because they're, if, if they can truly say that, they're no longer in bondage to sin. You're not a slave of sin. Uh, you're not a slave of self. self. So uh, only a Christian can truly say Jesus is Lord. Of course, Lord here is also a reference to Yahweh, Adonai. Uh, as in Lord God, because he is. But what does it say? That is a word of uh, faith which we preach. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's in the future tense. So the Calvinist order of salvation is backwards. They say you must be saved in order to say this. No. It says here, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will, future, be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. In other words, we are justified by faith alone. And with the mouth, confession is made unto or into, which in both these cases, unto is actually ice, which literally means into, into salvation. Jesus said, he that confesses be me before men, I will confess before my Father. So faith brings us to a righteous standing with God because we believe, and then confession, which is an act of faith, uh, identifies us with Christ because we confess him openly before men in some way. That's, that's really the role of baptism is a God-ordained means to confess Christ. So it's, it's an event, too, in the church. And so not only, it's not something for God's benefit, he knows what's in our heart. And it's not a, a, an essential thing. It's a good thing, it is, uh, but it is a confession of Christ, that you're identifying yourself as with Christ openly identifying with Christ. 
has to be at least somebody else present there because somebody you can't baptize yourself. So it's a confession of Christ before men. Uh, see, baptism's not mentioned here, but faith is. Faith and confession is mentioned. This, these are essential things. Uh, but faith itself brings you to justification, but justification is not the fullness of salvation. Abraham was justified, but he didn't have the promises of the new covenant. So you can be justified through faith, but not come fully into salvation. Even then, it's like Mike's, like, like the promises of the new covenant. If you don't walk in those promises, if you don't know the promises and trust God to bring them to pass, you know, as Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. We have to learn to walk by faith in the, in the sure promises of God. That is not the, you know, the prosperity kind of garbage. No, this is what God has promised to those who are his children uh, for this life, not simply for heaven. So you walk in those promises. You, you can wrestle with God like Jacob did, uh, Israel did. Why? It, because, you know, he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. God loves that kind of faith. You, that's not arrogance. That is trusting, that's believing God. It is a refusal to be satisfied with less than God has actually promised. See, if you, if you simply let it go and say, well, if it's God's will, he'll do this. No, that's not faith. Faith in God means you believe what he promised, and you will not settle for less because that is not to honor God. Settling for less than what he's promised is not to honor him. It's to dishonor him. It's to say, well, I guess God can't do it, or God doesn't want to do it. That is dishonoring God, dishonoring the cross, dishonoring Christ. Don't be satisfied for less than God has clearly promised. Again, this is the sure and solid promises of God, not what you want there to be there, not misusing God's promises, but using them according to his purpose. What was promised in the, in the, in the prophets and fulfilled in Christ, Pentecost. I mean, the tongues aren't the deal. The, 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 the promises of the new covenant are given in the old. So as the church is built on the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, referring to the new covenant and to Christ, and the apostles in the New Testament, not these current ones, the ones that delivered the gospel once and for all, the real apostles that Jesus chose, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, all in relation to him. He is the center. He is the reference point. The apostles and prophets have to be understood in relationship to him. And he in relationship to them. It's a unified thing. So he's saying here, you know, human arrogance would say, well, I'll, I'll go and bring Christ down from heaven, like the Catholic priest. I'm going to call Christ down to, from heaven and turn him into bread and wine. Or uh, I'm going to ascend into the abyss and bring Christ. To, I'll raise Christ from the dead. No, <laughs> that's, that's impossible arrogance, of course. That's Paul's point. It's impossible. But what does faith say? What does the word we proclaim say? Rather, instead of that, trusting in his finished work, in Christ, and what he has done, what God has done in Christ Jesus, and the promises of God. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the one who saved you, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth, or for with the, from the heart, that's, that seems like a reverse order, confess and then believe, but it's not. Uh, because Greek does, word order doesn't work the same way as English, uh, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord, uh, so, uh, for, for with the house, uh, 10, he explains, uh, verse 10, for with the heart one believes into righteousness, onto, into. You believe into Christ. The righteousness is in Christ. So you believe into Christ's righteousness, what he did on the cross, through faith in what Christ did, 
Christ is always the object of our faith, not something else. Christ himself is the object. So you believe into Christ. And because you believe into him, you're regarded as righteous. You trust, put your trust in Christ. Uh, in, in my case, I can remember I tried all kinds of things, in re including reading Billy Graham's book, How to Be, you know, instructions on how to be born again. I have that on the shelf someplace there. But it did nothing happen. I mean, I was desperate. I, I knew the Holy Spirit had made it very clear that, you know, I needed a Savior. Otherwise, I was going to where I knew I was going to. And that was into hell. And it was, and I richly deserved it. I did. So, that Christ was my only hope. But I, you know, it's like how how I, I was ignorant. I was utterly ignorant, because of the, the Lutheran Church doesn't teach you how to be saved. It assumes you're saved. They baptize you. You sprinkle you with water, and you're saved. It didn't work. Might have done something, but. I was lost. I was lost at that point, that's for sure. Of course, they don't believe that you're, you're eternally secure. So uh, I don't remember ever being saved, though. I never had a relationship with God, a right relationship, a true relationship. Did I believe he existed? Yeah, that's not the same thing. Did I pray to him? Yes. What did I pray for him for? I wanted things. God, do this for me. That was a prayer of Jabez, by the way which made the best-selling book. Why? Because it's self-centered. It appeals to sinners. So if you want to sell a lot of books, you have to appeal to what sinners want. I've noticed that in videos. If it's something about Christ, very few views. If it's something about the Scripture, about Christ, the Gospel, very few views. If it's about uh, some salacious thing about a scandal someplace, lots of views. <laughs> Just, you know, like, Two magnitudes more, 1,000 views, 2,000 views. If it's, if it's about Christ and the gospel, it's like maybe 100. What does that say? Is it the YouTube algorithm or people out there? I don't know. Or both, because the algorithm is probably based on sinful human desires. It's probably using... Uh, Oh, I know what they're, they're probably using AI and using uh, the the viewers of YouTube to train the AI to, to to create the maximum number of views. And if you're talking about Christ and Him crucified, well, that that isn't that popular. It's sort of like, but if you're talking about a Christian car wreck, like some so-called Christian that is caught up in sex scandal, that gets promoted. What else? Oh, the genocide in Gaza, too. That got a lot of attention. Because it's absolutely terrible. Oh. So what do we have here? So this is how you're saved. You believe in Christ onto Righteousness. You're righteous because you trust in Christ, and you confess Christ. Normally, baptism would be is a God ordained way to do that, and it has numerous benefits, but it doesn't it isn't absolutely essential. Confess Christ before men. I'm confessing Christ before men right now. I do it all the time. Well, not all the time, but. See, if, if you're truly born again, you'll have your ups and downs, your periods of, you know, valleys and, 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 and high hills. Uh, you can be at the mountaintop and then down in the valley. But you're still in Christ, and you still trust in Him, regardless, even if you're in deep depression. I've been there. I've been there. How did I get there? Too much attention on myself looking at myself too much. And I was in the state where I'd like to go out in the desert someplace and crawl under a rock and die, you know, that kind of position. And I kept it quiet. I didn't let anybody else know. And I certainly wasn't going to go to any shrink. <laughs> no, they don't know answers or drugs. No, there's no answers there. <laughs> Nothing but lies in those things. So 
what do you do? You just hold to Christ, trust in Christ. He'll bring you out. He'll bring you out. Trust in him. And you learn from that that God is faithful. Even when you're when you're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So if you truly belong to him, you think you're going to have everything uh, tiptoe to, through the tulips, you're going to be uh, happy, happy, happy like John Piper? No. No. You're going to have some dark times. And that's fully in accordance with God raising his children. They're there for a purpose, to shape you, to strengthen your faith, to strengthen your confidence in him, and you'll learn that God is always faithful, regardless of the circumstances. Don't reject it. Just hang on to him. You don't have to understand. He will demonstrate his faithfulness to you. He will reveal himself through these things that we suffer, much more through the suffering than through the mountaintop experiences. And after you've been through the through the one, you can the mountaintop is pretty easy to climb up. You can go out there and you know and you can experience God in a very real way, not in the way that we will, but to know that he's there and know that he's he's hearing you and you will experience God giving you understanding uh, just ask and you will receive we have the mind of Christ ask but you have to ask in faith believing that he does these things because they're promised to us again those are promises of the new covenant which is almost never mentioned among baptists or others evangelicals it's like they're ignorant why I don't understand. How can you so? How did Satan manage to so conceal the promises of God, the real promises? Why is it people aren't interested in that, or what? For the Scripture says, "Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame." It's faith. Faith is essential. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever, quoting from the Old Testament, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus said, all those who seek, find. All those who ask, it's given unto them. All those who knock, it's opened unto them. Salvation. If you really want it. If you want something else, God's not in the business of giving you other stuff. Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's the mission. If you want something else, go somewhere else. Go to Joel Osteen. Go to John Piper if you don't want salvation. Go to MacArthur or Boot or... Eric Mason, or any of these people, because they're offering something other than Jesus Christ. Your identity, your whatever you're seeking, your personal happiness. That's what you want. There's plenty of preachers out there that promise that. Whether they can deliver, something else. Whether that will save you, it will not. So if you're interested in being reconciled, a sinner being reconciled to God, and receiving the gift of eternal life and spending eternity with God, as he is your exceedingly great reward, well, this is how you do it. You start by calling upon him to save you. And a lost sinner in bondage to sin can do that, just like the demoniac of the Gadarenes came running to Christ. He was possessed by a, a legion of demons. But you're not completely devoid of will. He came in that state, came running to Christ. Why? He recognized somehow that that was his salvation. And Christ came there deliberately for that purpose, to deliver this man. And that there's no evidence this man was even Jewish. 
God saves sinners. This was a man that was in deep bondage. So what did he do? He came running, crying out. And then the demons started. But his running toward Christ was crying out for salvation. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's the name of the Lord? L-O-R-D. Yahweh. Yeshua. God saves. God is our salvation. That is Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. Whoever shall call upon him, upon the Savior that is God, who came into the world to save us, you call upon him and you shall be saved. If you call upon him for salvation, how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? So there is a faith that he is the Messiah. That is not the same as the kind of faith you will have when he saves you. That is, you know, you don't have to have perfect faith to call upon him. Just sufficient faith to call upon him. A sinner has that kind of faith. You're not the Calvinists make you unable to do anything. That's not true. That's not biblical. See, because it says you shall be saved, that's future tense. So you don't call him on him as a saved person. You call upon him to save you as an unsaved person. <laughs> Somehow they reverse that <laughs> because of their theology. So they say that a sinner can't call upon Christ. Yes, you can. You absolutely can. I was a sinner when I called upon Christ. And when I did that, then I knew that Christ died for me. After I'd called upon him, after I exhausted all hope and just basically emptied my, you just threw myself in the hands of God, trusting, and it's like, I can't do this. I can't save myself. What can I, I can't? I give up. And I, I did say, I remember saying, Lord, if you don't save me, I will not be saved. I knew there was more than what I'd been raised with. And I certainly needed more than what I'd been raised with. But I didn't have the faith you have as a saved person at that point. You don't need that. Don't listen to the Calvinists. Like John MacArthur, hard to believe. No, it's not. All you have to do is desire it. Whosoever asks, receives. If you desire salvation from sin, from the wrath of God. If you want to get saved from a predicament, that's different. From trouble, that's not the same thing. That's not salvation. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So the gospel is the pro proclamation of the gospel. They have to know what the gospel is. They have to know about Jesus Christ. They have to know that a person is saved by faith. That's why it is said this, that there has to be preachers. There has to be a communication. It doesn't have to be from a man speaking it. It can be from reading it in the scriptures. The, the, the message of the gospel must be communicated to people. And that's where we come in. Preachers, we come in. Or it doesn't have to be a, a person that communicates it. Somehow. Verbally or in a letter or a message or a video or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's the, 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 the issue is they must know about Jesus. 
They must know he is the Savior. They must know that salvation is by the grace of God through faith in him. That he died for their sins. And when they're saved, you will know that with certainty that he died for your sins. So that's, but again, you call upon him not yet being saved. And because you call upon him to save you, you shall be saved. It might not happen instantly, but he will fulfill his word because God is faithful. Christ is faithful. Then he goes in about uh, those that have not believed the gospel and you know, the, the Jews that did not believe it because there was a question being raised apparently. Uh, how come all the, not all the Jews believe? Well, is it because, does Paul say because it's not God's will? No. It's very clear. That, that Paul's very clear. He does, God desires all people to be saved. Why aren't all people saved? Well, some of them don't call upon him to save them. And, uh, it, and the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit is necessary in this. He's the one that draws us to Christ. But you can resist him. The Scripture says you can resist the Holy Spirit. Calvinists deny that. They say grace is unresistible because of their logic, not because of God's Word. So uh, that's how salvation works. So if it's anything other than that, if it's other than Christ crucified, Christ risen from the dead, and salvation through faith in Christ, it's not the gospel. So anything that's something else like this, or this, or this, or this whole stack of books over here, that's not the gospel. That's how you tell the real from the false. If it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ delivered to us by the apostles in the scripture, that gospel, but they're promoting something else, that's phony. That's not the real thing. There's only one real gospel. And Satan, the world, the flesh, and the devil are always trying to push us away from the real gospel. And having been saved, trying to push us away from living by faith in Christ and his promises. Into techniques, into psychology, into other things that man invents and Satan uses to divert us from walking by faith in Christ and his promises. Because he knows that if we do that, we have victory. We overcome through him. And they, uh, as in the book of Revelation, it says about the saints, and they overcame through the blood of the Lamb, through the word of their testimony, and by not loving their lives even unto death. By believing in Christ and his sacrifice, by, by confessing him, and by abiding in him, persevering in faith in him. That's how we overcome. Faith is our victory, as the scripture says. <laughs>